Okay, so uh, let me say a few words about uh, Missy as an, as an introduction. Um, Dr. Schultz, Schultz, Stoltz is a sustainability and innovations manager for the city of Ann Arbor. In this role, she works with all city operations, residents, businesses, and the University of Michigan nonprofits and others to make Ann Arbor one of the most sustainable and equitable cities in America. Prior to joining the city, Missy worked with cities and tribal communities around the nation to advance their climate and sustainability goals, including during her time as a climate director at the IC ICLE Local Government for Sustainability and as a consultant to philanthropic organizations. Missy has a PhD in urban resilience from the University of Michigan, a master's in climate and society from Columbia University, and undergraduate degrees in marine biology and environmental science from the University of New England. So uh, let's turn it over to Missy for the presentation on the, on the bold, aggressive A20 carbon neutrality strategy. You got it, Carl. Thank you for having me and thank you all for coming. Just a quick check. Can you see my slides okay? Thumbs up. All right, it takes great. Well, it is wonderful to be with you all. Montgomery County is certainly a vanguard in a lot of the work that um, I, I think about and do around climate change and resilience broadly. I'm lucky enough to be a part of a network with some of the staff that work on these issues. So uh, I'm delighted to be with you all today. What I wanted to cover, um, Carl, thank you for this opportunity. You reached out and so I think you get a lot of the credit uh, for the conversations we've had back and forth. I'm just gonna give you a little bit of context. I'm really gonna spend um, maybe 20, 25 minutes most talking about kind of the vision, the purpose, the process, and what is in this living plan. And then I'm gonna turn it over to you guys for your questions, thoughts, um, concerns, anything is open and on the table. So with that, um, just a little bit of context. Ann Arbor's been doing climate work since 2000. We've actually had a full-time employee in the office doing this work. Our first climate plan was 2012. And like many, these numbers look familiar. Um, this was considered pretty forward-looking at the time. These were the goals that were driving a lot of work in the city. Uh, the city formally adopted our climate action plan and we were making progress we were on we hit the first target we were on track for the second target and we thought things were great but of course the science has told us that's not aggressive enough so the city formally started an office of sustainability and innovations we had had someone doing the work but they sort of moved around in the organization were pretty buried and then in 2018 the city administrator at the time decided that this had to be a top priority and so formed a, a formal office of sustainability and i was lucky enough to be appointed the first director of that report directly to the city administrator we have a city administrator form of government so it's the chief administrator for all the decision making of our, of our city and when i came on board the first thing i did was uh, say okay well our next target is 2025 so we've got to figure out how we're going to hit a 25% reduction by 2025, and the science tells us that's not enough anyway. So let's work at a 35 to 40% reduction over the next five years. And we created this work plan. Well, then lo and behold, November 4th comes, and at this point in time, uh, we have just gotten our very first budget for the office, and we are running at implementing all of these actions, and we sort of pump a break, and we get the climate emergency declaration, which we had worked with our um, climate mobilization group in Ann Arbor and a bunch of other climate organizations to craft and to support. And what came out of it actually was this um, kind of middle ground where we said, okay, let's aim for carbon neutrality community-wide by 2035. And on the floor, council said, absolutely not, go for 2030. You can do it, we're gonna figure it out. And then they said, and oh, by the way, you get no staff and you get no budget. And so we said, okay, um, we're gonna focus on the first part carbon neutrality by 2030, and we're gonna come back and we're gonna ask for staff and we're gonna ask for budget because we're gonna be serious about what it's gonna to take to do this. But let's first go through a really comprehensive planning process to understand what, what it means, what's necessary to achieve community-wide carbon neutrality in that time frame. And they told us you have until March 31st to bring that plan to us. So you can kind of back out. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with government processes, but that doesn't mean you get to finish a plan on March 30th actually means you had to finish your plan around March 1st in order to get it through internal vetting. We had about four months to create this plan that was going to completely revolutionize our community, right? So we took about a day and there were some tears and like anxiety and then we got to work. So what we launched was this. So A20 is our platform, our carbon neutrality um, umbrella. 
It's what every action is going to be branded under. It is what the entire process is branded under. It is the name of the website. The intent is to make this super easy for constituents to understand. These things all feed in to this brand. And underneath, I'll talk about those three words. They were really carefully chosen because we think they align with the values. They align with our values of the office, but we think they align with the values of the community based on this fact. So the charge that we had, um, our greenhouse gas inventory, I won't spend a lot of time in this because I know you guys know these numbers, you've thought about them. For us, our emissions have been tracking down. That's great. We have roughly had a 14%, um, well, closer to 17% community-wide greenhouse gas reduction over time, according to about 22,000 metric tons per year of course, um, we have to get to zero, right? So we have to take a sloping curve and drop it drastically to hit that 2030 target. And what we're working with is about 2.1 million metric tons um, that need to, we need to close that gap in effectively, at this point, you know, 10 and a half years. So not to belabor it, this is our emissions profile. Obviously very critical to understand how to be surgical in reducing those emissions. You need to understand where they're coming from. For us, we look different than a lot of other places. You'll notice, Stationary fuel is 80% of the emissions in our region. That's primarily because our electric grid is pretty darn dirty. We have a lot of coal on that grid. And then the other side is transportation in Ann Arbor is actually pretty small. Um, we have a lot of students. We have a lot of folks who are living downtown and they're walking. We have really good transit. So we know what's gonna happen is that 17% is eventually gonna grow and take over the rest of the pie. And we're starting to see that happen nationally. So um, I'm, I'll talk about that later. This is often a sticking point for a lot of people when they think about, um, you know, let's focus on just uh, stationary fuels and let's not focus on transportation. I think that's a really big mistake because what'll happen is the others are easier to kind of tackle and find solutions for. Transportation solutions, often tidal land use solutions, and those take a very long time and often have a lot of resistance. And we need to start things that are gonna take time. We can't wait, right? So we have to do things that get wins now, but we also have to build momentum in the future. I'm happy to take that um, in more depth in the Q&A. Of course, um, I don't know how familiar you all are. There are standard protocols that municipalities, counties, um, any kind of unit of local government use when they do their greenhouse gas inventories. And the idea here is um, our inventory can be compared to Montgomery County's inventory. And that can be compared to New York City's inventory and London's inventory and Bergen's inventory because we count things in a certain way. And so this is just to say, if you want to dive into any technical details, I can tell you what was in and what's out. Um, and there are some things that are really hard for people to swallow that are not in our inventory. Some of them we are going to try to include in future calculations, and some of them simply are, there, there's no standard way to do it. So I can see a lot of you, you are sitting in buildings, and the buildings we are sitting in have embedded emissions associated with them. I don't calculate those emissions. My team doesn't calculate those emissions in our inventory. And it's not because they don't matter, it's because I don't have that information for every single type of build and every single piece of material that went into all of the infrastructure in our entire community. So it's not meant to downplay that portion, it's just meant to be realistic about what I can say with certainty in terms of our emissions. It doesn't mean we don't think about those things, it just means when I talk about that 2.1 million metric ton baseline, those aren't in. Again, we are working uh, with peers around the world to figure out methodologies to be able to calculate some of the things that aren't currently in our world. The other thing I just wanted to highlight, um, emissions within the city of Ann Arbor from transportation are pretty small, but we are a destination. And so this is one of the areas where we are gonna change our math and, and why we wanna do this is the numbers here. Basically in a non-COVID day, work day, 85,000 vehicles are coming into our city. 25,000 people are moving in the city and 20,000 are moving out. We are a destination, right? And so right now, inventories capture people as soon as they hit the border of Ann Arbor. But we've got 85,000-ish people that are traveling from around the region. And I wanna think about regional transportation solutions. And so I need to understand where they're coming from and I wanna take credit for their entire commute every day. So we're trying to expand that, which means that 17% is gonna grow to probably more something akin to 24 to um, just kind of flagging that. So the framing, this gets more at um, the plan itself and the process we went through for the plan. I talk very fast, so I do apologize, but I wanna make sure we cover this. There are, um, it was really important that we ground our work in values. And there were three overarching values that the community espouses a lot and that are critical to the office and the work that we do. And the very first one is equity. Everything that we do needs to be fundamentally grounded in equity. 
the people bearing the disproportionate burden of climate impacts, of COVID impacts, are our low income and minority populations. And climate change is gonna exacerbate that. It already is exacerbating those inequalities. And so we needed to be authentic and sincere about solutions that are really grounded in equity and to hold ourselves accountable when things don't work out the way that we want, because they won't. So underneath the value are characteristics that we tried to integrate into the plan and that we're still using, trying to live that value of equity. Of course, sustainability is really important. None of us want a plan that lives on a shelf. We want this to be living, we want this to succeed, we want this to have a life of its own that other things sort of come under, be that our master plan, our land use plan, um, our budget, all of these things sort of tie and this becomes the plan that guides the city. And then lastly is transformation. And this one will be my slight soapbox for the night. And I'll say, science is very clear where we're headed. We're headed for a future with pretty catastrophic climate impacts. We're already experiencing them in some places. We're heading for growing disparities, economic disparities, job opportunities, disparities in access to information and knowledge. And I don't want that future. And I don't think you do either. And that leaves us with little choice but to focus on disruption and transformation. And so transformation can be very, very, very uncomfortable for people when they like the situation they're in. And so part of what we've been trying to work through is how we um, foster a vision of a transformative future that people are excited about. And that includes everything from institutionally being okay with small failures, because in bureaucracies, they're set up not to fail, right? And so how do we nurture a culture of growth and of experimentation and innovation, both in our institution, but also within our community? And how do we fundamentally change services so that we prioritize the needs of our frontline populations, as opposed to our affluent individuals who scream the loudest and have more political clout? And that can be very uncomfortable, I think that's um, I think that's authentic to what at least our office thinks a lot about. So the mission is the mission of the city of Ann Arbor, uh, right? We want to do this and deliver exceptional services that enhance and sustain our wonderful community. The vision guides everything that we do, and that is that together our community is creating and implementing a just transition to carbon neutrality. So we don't want to do this on the backs of our minority and poor populations. We don't want to do this on the backs of our working mothers. Um, we want to find a way that this is um, a, a truly just transition to a future that's better uh, for nearly all of us. So the process that we went through was intense and um, I'm pretty proud, I'm really proud of my team and the work that they did. I frame this as a funnel. At the top of the funnel are the inputs. So we had obviously a lot of public input um, and I'll talk about that in a second. We pulled heavily from peer cities. We are highly networked as is Montgomery County. Um, I was on the phone with them three weeks ago. I don't know. I can't tell time in the COVID world, but a while ago I was on the phone with them about something else. Um, staff have expertise, of course, that we brought to bear, and we had technical advisors as well. Um, we also used things like uh, peer-reviewed literature, project drawdown, other points of information. And then the process itself was in these three buckets. The first bucket is the beginning of the funnel. We call it ideation. It's where all of those different inputs threw in ideas. And they said, what if we did this? Or how about this? We had uh, ideas from the public, we had ideas from our technical experts, and everything was given equal consideration. The second phase was then a prioritization where we got to the middle of the funnel and we had to kind of start weeding things out. And so we had a pretty robust prioritization framework that we moved things through, but looked at everything from cost feasibility, technical feasibility, equity. Um, equity had a high ranking, um, of course, in that, given the values I've shared with you, um, all kinds of different criteria. And then the last phase really focused on how. How are we going to do these things that fell out as the top actions? So we had a total 82 working days, which still blows my mind. Um, we ran three public surveys. The last two surveys grossed over 1,000 respondents. We held 68 public events. We had 80 scheduled. We had to cancel 12 due to COVID. Um, we had two large town halls that had hundreds of people in attendance. We had 80 technical advisors. And we used partner organizations to expand our work, of which we had 66 formal partners. This is our um, timeline, just kind of linearly. Everything was iterative. No one's input mattered more than others. So technical advisors were telling us what was technically possible, but that had to be balanced with what was socially feasible, right? So we might get ideas from technical advisors and integrate them into a survey, and the public would crash you know, certain ideas and like, absolutely not, we're not interested, and other things would bubble as being completely acceptable. And so everything kind of iterated back and forth in the process. 
Um, this is just a breakdown of the public events we had. And what I want to emphasize here is that the events were not, there were some that are kind of your traditional events, but the majority weren't. So we had a climate trivia night with some of our climate organizations at a bar, right? And that was fun. And we, you know, we got like our traditional stakeholders. That was great. That was important. But we also uh, went to all of our affordable housing sites and we brought food and we talked to people about um, their kind of pain points and what they were excited about in terms of the future and integrated that into our plan. We worked with at-risk youth and had them help be ambassadors in this work. We sent a backpack flyer to 11,000 um, kids and their caregivers in our public school system and our K through eight public school system um, to get them and get input into this process. We worked with Meals on Wheels, so every homebound resident in Ann Arbor got information about this program and was able to get feedback into it. We really tried to do things a little differently, which would not have been possible without our partner organizations, for sure, unequivocally. Um, this is just to note the surveys followed that same process. They focused on why we do, why should we do this, what should we do, and how should we do it. Um, the respondent profile is comparable to the city of Ann Arbor profile. I will point out though, as a learning tool, it didn't start this way. The first survey, I would argue, was a total failure. Um, it was affluent, white, and we had no one under the age of 18 that took the survey. And so we met with stakeholders and figured out how to how to repurpose the survey, how to rebrand it, how to do things differently to try to bring those constituents to the table. And we were really happy then with survey two and three because it started to look more like our plan. So getting towards what's actually in the plan really quick, um, the one, this is the last caveat slide before I tell you what's in, that is strategies are interconnected and they're entangled. And in particular, this is true, um, I talk about strategies and actions and I'll share that in a second what I mean. We took great care in our calculations to make sure we didn't double count the value of reductions. If you're thinking about transit, for example, you get reductions in emissions when you have more people ride. And you can get reductions in emissions from land use when you have more people in an area that are capable of walking or because you have better um, active and passive transit, right? You have sidewalks, you've got bike lanes, they feel safe, et cetera. But you can't double count that, right? Because people live closer to transit, they're likely to take transit. And because there's better transit, they're likely to take better transit. But those same people might, one of those might have tipped them. So we had to do a whole bunch of calculations to make sure we didn't double count. And of course, they're only assumptions. The methodology that we used was just to document all of our assumptions so we can easily make changes should we find that things are tracking higher or lower than what we anticipated. This is important because it's not a, the plan. All of these plans are not simple. It's not like a buffet, right, where you pick something out and you just replace it with something else. You can take things out, but it has cascading impacts. So adding something that felt back in necessitates that we do a whole bunch of analysis, which is totally our job and fine. But it, it's an important distinction. So what do we propose to do? I know you're all so excited. Um, okay, what I'm gonna share with you are seven overarching strategies, and then I'm not gonna go through the following slides, but I'll share them with Carl. So if you wanna dive into more richness about the actions under them, these seven strategies, the way I frame this, these are the things that are the least movable in our plan. So these are the most solid kind of bedrock um, things within our plan. The actions, of which there are 44, those are a lot more fluid, right? So here's what I mean. Strategy one is obvious to everybody. We have to power our electrical grid with 100% clean and renewable. That includes, of course, microgrids, different kinds of technologies, demand management strategies, battery storage, um, upgrades to that infrastructure. There's a whole bunch of things that are necessary to make this happen, but there simply is not a path if we can't get our electrical grid clean. Now, how we do that is the actions that are on following slides. There is far more flexibility in what those actions look like, but what we're giving to and what we've given our elected leaders are what the public said and what we think are the most likely success actions. The second strategy, that grid is now getting cleaner, then we're gonna electrify, right? So we're switching our um, appliances and our vehicles over to electric that is now powered with 100% clean energy. We of course have to improve the energy efficiency of everything, every infrastructure that we have. What is fundamentally different in this calculus though is we can't phase it anymore. We don't have time to phase. We can't say, okay, let's do massive energy efficiency improvements and then in five years, we're gonna come back and work on electrification and in five years, we're gonna come back and work on massive 
we have to find ways of packaging this so that when we go into a home or a business, we're getting all of these services and it's really, really easy for them and really cost effective. So that's what we're actively working through right now. The fourth was the one that gave me the most heartburn, candidly, and that was how we were going to reduce vehicle miles traveled in our community by 50%. Um, what I would say is COVID has shown me, obviously, that it's possible. We've achieved um, week over week 50% reduction. In some weeks, we've hit 70% reduction. And what I want to be careful to say is I'm not saying that COVID is good for vehicle miles traveled reduction. That's not what I'm saying. I couldn't imagine what it looked like when our streets had 50% less vehicles on them. I couldn't even visualize it because I, I, couldn't, I couldn't imagine we would get there in any way. What I can see now as I look out my window, I can imagine what it looks like to have bike lanes all over those streets. I can imagine what it looks like to go down to one lane or two lane as opposed to four lane roads and to put sidewalks all over that and protected bike lanes and trees and different kinds of infrastructure in place. And I think people can too. And so now I actually think this is possible um, in a way that wasn't at least for me and my, my personal limitations before. The fifth strategy is changing our relationship with what we use and how we use it. And it's basically all the materials around us. Why are we purchasing what we're purchasing? Why are we, what are we doing with it? What are we doing at its end of life? Um, this is getting inherently to a circular economy. Is, um, and this is what this is all about. It's just articulated differently. The sixth is not about greenhouse gas reductions. It is another foundation. So equity is clear. Um, it's, it's throughout everything in here, and I can share that later, why and how we do that. The other is resilience, right? Climate change is already here. You know this. We're already feeling the impact. Um, I think it would be disingenuous if we didn't acknowledge that and work on building the resilience of our community. And this is one that is really timely in, in the COVID moment. This is exactly what we should be investing in. And this is the argument I make every day with my the other executives in the city is shame on us if we're not investing in the resilience of our people in our place, because we know exactly who's most impacted by COVID. And those are gonna be, those individuals are gonna be further impacted by climate and natural disaster disruptions that are coming. And so this is our chance to, to be better. And then we cheated and we threw in another. Um, and this is, uh, I sort of joke that it's a cheat. It's basically cross-cutting things. So our equity work, we lead a lot of the city's equity initiatives. That doesn't belong anywhere, it belongs everywhere. And so it was disingenuous to kind of try to put it in one of these categories. We also run a grant program where residents can get up to $10,000 to do something related to sustainability in the public space. So you can't get $10,000 for solar on your roof, but you could get $10,000 to make an investment in a public park, or we've given grants to help um, our bike co-op uh, purchase and repurpose bikes for low-income residents. So there's all kinds of things uh, that people can apply for. And then we do have carbon offsets in here because despite all of those activities, we still need uh, a little bit of help. So I'm gonna round this out here. I'm gonna go through the last things and not talk about them, but you'll have them. Um, so there's maybe three or four more slides I wanna talk about. This one just acknowledges that there are so many co-benefits to the work that we're doing. And it's really easy to fall into the dollars and cents trap. And we want to make sure that um, to make, that's going to happen. It happens all the time. But we wanted to acknowledge these other co-benefits because it doesn't matter if you care about climate. You probably care about something on here, whether that's job creation, um, local energy production, resilience, whatever it may be. And so what's beautiful about climate work for me, at least, is it, I can speak to almost anyone based on their value system and find commonality. Maybe not 100% commonality, but we almost always have something that we share. So these are the slides I'm not, I'm not gonna talk through. Um, basically what it is is strategy is on top and then the actions we're proposing in the living plan are here. Our plan is living, it's going to change. Um, we have a governance document that we've created and we also have, excuse me, um, a prioritization matrix. So as new ideas come in, they can be evaluated. Uh, um, in the same kind of rigor that these actions were evaluated. So happy to talk about these with you. I'll leave them up just for a second so you guys can see what's in. Um, this is our energy efficiency work. There's far more detail in the plan and I'll drop the link to the plan in the chat when we're done. Uh, land use strategies, transit. This again is basically about our circular economy, which you see mentioned here. This is our resilience work. This is about both uh, disaster management as well as long-term social cohesion and capacity building. These are our others. Here's the math. <clears throat> so 
what it basically breaks down to, um, we, the University of Michigan, there's no reason you should remember this, uh, they're the largest slice of our pie. And so we had to do estimates assuming the university was in and assuming the university was out. The university is simultaneously going through a carbon neutrality planning process. I sit on that commission. We aren't done. We don't know what the recommendations are. So we had to guess because of our timeline what they may put in. Again, that's all going to change as soon as they have an official plan, we'll be able to update the numbers. This is first strategy, what it looks like. Here's our modeling. So we have, um, we did an intensive modeling where we looked at each of the actions, each of the actions under the strategies. We looked at um, the cost per year. We looked at how many households it would take to get there. What are all the assumptions embedded in that? How many staff are we going to need? What are um, not just kind of absolute costs, how much physical infrastructure costs versus soft costs? And this is how we got to our modeling. We end up with a 14% offset if the university is in with us. If the university doesn't participate, we go to a 34% offset to give you a sense of the magnitude of our university. We also did a year-over-year -year analysis of what it would take if every single thing was implemented. You'll notice a spike in 2025. That's because we call for massive investments in public transit, and this is the year in which we project that coming online. So this is bus rapid transit, this is regional transit, electrification of all of our transit. There's a lot that goes into that number. And we also ran the staffing model. So we're actively trying to get our office, um, our, our budget ask for the next year is three staff, and it's going from a team of six to a team of nine, so we can start creeping up. We'll probably um, aim after COVID world for a team of 15, because that's kind of the basic that we have to have to maintain. And then we would argue we need contract labor um, or consultants to help supplement in years where we have peaks in, uh, in performance. Here's one other thing that I'll add. This is uh, one of the last slides I like to talk through. The cost of this plan has gotten a lot of attention and it's because the plan came in at a billion dollars, a billion, right? And a billion during a, a pandemic is a really hard number to swallow. Well, it's not a billion dollars, and um, I wanted to share that with you. The reason it's not a billion dollars is, one, we already spend money, right? So if to the extent that this becomes an actual priority for the city, it, we repurpose a lot of the money that we have. Not saying we take it away from other things, but a lot of the staffing needs can get reprioritized, right? So my team has a budget of almost $2 million a year. I just raised $22 million towards the billion dollars. My entire team just did one. Well, um, it also, when the planners take this on, some of their time comes over, and so it sort of chips away over time. Second, it's an investment. It's not just a cost. We all know that making investments in things like energy efficiency are truly that. They pay themselves back over time. And not everything in here will, but the vast majority of things in here have paybacks that may not come to the city itself, but are going to come to our residents and our commercial enterprises, and that's not being factored into the discussion, and so we're trying to change that narrative. The last part is no one's ever talking about the cost of inaction. And so the best we have to be able to calculate the cost of inaction is the social cost of carbon. And so what we did, our very first inventory is in 2000. Our most recent update is 2018. We're finishing 2019 now. But if you just look over time, our community at a $55 a ton um, price for carbon is responsible for over $2.3 billion of cost to society. If you look forward, if we don't take action in the next 10 years, it's $1.8 billion. There is a cost of not doing what we need to do. And it, we think it's time that that be integrated into the conversation. And so we're trying to be authentic about the fact that we're responsible for quite a lot of emissions. And again, this only goes to 2000. We know there's far more that we've polluted. We just don't have the hard figures to be able to track that. This is an impossible slide. This is the last year. It's transitioning to what we're focusing on this year and next year of that like crazy list of 44 things. Um, I think there's only 22 here that are high priority. So, you know, we're, we've got lots of time on our hands. Um, but I'll stop there. So questions, concerns, thoughts? I will go to the chat box. Missy, thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Thank you. In, in a record amount of time, because I, I watched your 90-minute presentation for the council, and uh, that was that was a lot a lot of information in it too. You and 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 I want to point out to everyone that um, we actually put the link to the draft plan in the invite for this Zoom meeting, but uh, in addition. Uh, 
Missy, you can put it into the chat room and we can make sure that everybody gets a, access to a copy of it, the actual great. document. Great. That's great. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk, turn it over to Dorcas. Um, Dorcas, do we have questions? I see one. It looks like uh, Dorcas might have gotten disconnected. Well, wait a minute. Um, okay, so let me go back a second, and and um, I misstepped there for a second. I want to turn it over to Herb Simmons. Um, Herb has, uh, I think, an, uh, an introductory question to give you to get the dialogue started. Thanks, Carl. Um, and thank you, Missy. Uh, I am in awe of what you were able to accomplish in four months. Uh, in a couple of previous lives, I was a city manager and a county manager, and uh, I would have loved to have had you on my staff or maybe have been on your staff back then. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a great, uh, just a amazing thanks for your work and its influence on the rest of us. Uh, you know, we're at 29 months since our resolution was passed and actively engaged in the planning process right now. Uh, I've got two questions, uh, one a process question and one a substance question to kind of kick off what I hope will be a, an interesting uh, dialogue over the next few minutes. Um, speaking of the four months, um, I'm, you probably weren't thrilled to hear that you only had four months. And if you had been given a longer period of time, uh, how much time would you have asked for and how might the plan have been different, both in terms of the process you used and the substance that came out of it? That's my first question. I'll let you answer that and then I'll ask my follow-up. Yeah, that's a, it's a really interesting question. So my mind instantly went to, as painful as four months was, I'm glad it was short um, for a few reasons. One is, it's wrong. Every plan is wrong the instant you finish it, right? Like it, it, it's meant to be directional. It's meant to kind of give us ideas and let us do our job. For four months, we did almost nothing else, right? Because of the intensity of this work. It, I have actually been doing almost nothing else the last few weeks as I've been responding to council. Um, you may have seen, we've, we've had to do a few follow-ups for them. I am so desperate to do this work that I am glad that the plan is either going to get adopted or it's not, but we now know what we need to do so we can actually move forward. The things I, you know, a more robust public engagement process is always valuable, but we've put together a governance plan that says we're going to do an annual summit, we're going to uh, launch a new task force of staff from the major institutions in the community to organize around this, we're going to do an annual survey, and we have a framework to update the plan. So. For me, my bias, I do have a PhD in planning, right? So like I think about this sometimes. A plan isn't a checkbox, right? Let's have a list of check items. It, it is very much that directional sense. I honestly don't think I would take more time. We gotta get to work. We gotta get, to, we gotta get things done. That's where I am though. Well, Sorry. Yeah. Maybe we ought to end this uh, webinar a little early so we can all get back to work then. I'm feeling guilty just listening, but um, Hold on, I gotta see what's on my net list next. But no. uh, my, my substantive question is, um, and there's many, but I'll just ask one and turn it over. Um, I was um, uh, very uh, uh, pleased and, and, and intrigued in looking at the one uh, chart that you had in the document that had a very simple metric that um, many of us have really been trying to have uh, developed here in the county and ever, elsewhere and that is the cost of CO2 per ton uh, emitted or avoided emitted. Um, mm -hmm. And looking at, at that chart was fascinating. Um, pull it up too. And, yeah, I was gonna say that if I remember the uh, community choice energy or community choice aggregation was more than a third of your uh, carbon emissions in that one action at a cost of I think $4 a ton. And many of the transportation uh, capital expenditures like for electrification of buses and so forth was on the order of five, six, if I remember, $7,000 a ton or uh, literally a 1, thousand, 1,500 times more expensive per ton. Obviously there are co-benefits and uh, you know, the story is not just that number. Right. But I'm wondering if you could just address uh, anything you'd like in regard to what I've just said about how you came up with that number, how you're using it, how it's played out, 
and so forth? It's, um, it's a really powerful number and it's a really unfortunate number um, because you can use it any way you want to, which is the same with the billion dollar estimate um, that I gave. I'm trying to pull it up so people can see it here. So let me just share my screen as an example uh, in case people haven't seen it. So the power of that number, well, let me start with the process of how we got there. So what we did, of course, when we had the candidate list of actions, we had an intensive two week period. And I, I mean that you can imagine that with 82 days, we had 14, maybe 15 days. We had a contractor on board who supplemented staff expertise and we sprinted at quantifications for every action. And so we outlined, we have this matrix that outlines all of the assumptions. Oops, sorry, my button. Let me get out of this one. Outlines all of the assumptions and got us the greenhouse gas reduction, right? And then we did a, a similar analysis on all the costs of it. And so we were able then to do a cost per ton analysis because we had this right. So here you go, you can see cost. So community choice aggregation comes in at $4 uh, per ton, bulk purchasing of renewables comes in at seven. And there is, there's huge discrepancies, right? As you move, as you move through. Right, so here's the downside. You could look at this and say, well, jettison this, jettison this, like this doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, let's go over to our transportation, which definitely don't look like they make sense if I can get over there. Um, it becomes really easy for people to pick and choose what they want. The thing is, things aren't that easy, right? That we didn't quantify our loan loss reserve. We didn't quantify the benchmarking ordinance that we're working on because they're sort of foundational pieces that enable other things to happen. And so there's nesting that inherently takes place. The other downside is something like transit. Well, here's what's gonna happen, right? If we don't electrify transit, great. I just figured out all of our electricity emissions and all that we're left with is transit emissions. And we could choose to offset them. I don't know how you feel about that. Our community is not super happy with an offset. So we're gonna have to make those investments anyway. And they're gonna be even more money down the line. And so it became this, um, it's, it can be weaponized. Right, in, in a way that I think we have to be prepared to talk about because the most common question I get is around this. Like, why would we do the transportation things? They're just not economical. And my response is, well, we're gonna do them sometime if you're serious about carbon neutrality. So it's probably better to have a plan that puts them in there because guess what? I'm suddenly far more competitive for grants because we're serious about it and we can plan about it. And I can go to partners and say, you know, this is part of our path. How are you gonna, how are you stepping up to be part of this vision? So I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really important. It's always a two-edged sword with any of these numbers, and right. is uh, uh, you live by it and you die by it, depending upon how it's used and how it's misused. Right. Uh, yep. And uh, but it it does seem to be to be a very foundational kind of metric, though, that has to be calculated with all the caveats and so forth, and just mm -hmm. to make sure, of course, that it's not misused. But uh, uh, thanks for that. And I guess uh, uh, Dorcas, are you then going to? Uh, Take over from here. Are you on, Dorcas? Her, Dorcas has got computer problems. Oh, okay. So uh, she asked me to step in um, to back her up. Um, so we have one question uh, that's on the chat uh, uh, from uh, Nancy. She wanted to know, Missy, will you at some point be adding embodied energy in your plan? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think we're open to adding anything into the calculations. So the, the clearest vision I have, like where I know we're headed, is those transportation emissions, because we, we are already pulling that data to look at the whole range of the commute for people in. We've been talking about um, looking at embodied embedded emissions in things. That is trickier. It's, and I hope this makes sense why it's trickier. It is not it's hard, but it's not impossible for us to do it as individuals to understand the embedded emissions and what we purchase or the embodied emissions in our homes. It gets tricky though when I have to do it for the entire community. And so we've got to find a methodology that allows us to do that and say something with some certainty, um, especially if I'm going to integrate it into the carbon neutrality work. So yes, I don't know when. And the other part of that answer is that doesn't mean we're not working on solutions that address embedded emissions in other things. So just because I don't have a baseline and historical record doesn't mean we're not thinking about reducing it going forward, if that makes sense. Great. 
Um, I have a question that I'd like to pose. Um, so similar to us here, we're, we're a county, mm -hmm. you're a city in a large state. Um, and um, I think in our case, and it seems like your case, part of your uh, ability to reach the 230, 2030 goal is this, the state allows you to enable legislation for the CCA mm -hmm. um, and maybe other things. Uh, and we're facing that um, challenge in, here as well. Um, so um, I know, um, I think one of the keys is to get other parts of the state behind you so how do you, how are you addressing that? Because just to tell you that our, well, before the COVID-19 shut down our legislature, um, we were trying to get a similar CEA, CCA bill passed and they were only willing to let Montgomery County be a pilot test for the next seven years to see mm -hmm. if it worked. So there's, a, there's some ambivalence about doing that and um, so how, what is your approach to dealing with your legislature and, and do you think that you will be successful? It's a, good, it's a really, really good question. And now that we're recording, I want to be careful how much, just in case people okay. on the other side are listening. Um, no, somewhat teasing. We're, we're networked around the state with lots of municipalities. So we have frequent conversations with um, Ann Arbor, Grand Rapids, and uh, Detroit are sort of like, we're a little trifecta, right? That we talk to each other all the time and we try to coordinate. But we also are pulling in municipalities in other areas that are far more conservative and that their legislators have more cachet, right? So I don't know if this is true for you, but for us, when our legislators from Ann Arbor, they'll take anything we give them. They're like, yes, let's run at this. Let's talk. No more investor owned utilities, get rid of them. And then everyone's just laughs, right? Because they're like, that's Ann Arbor. Like it has no traction, no weight whatsoever. Yeah. So it's not going to be an effective strategy have our legislators take this forward. So we are trying to work with our peers around the state uh, to get them to actually be the champions, but we have the capacity, right? So we have to do most of the work for our peers to be able to take it. So that's kind of one of the, the strategies. The other has been, um, you know, honestly, like we're going to the utility. I think, it, I think it was last Monday, and I do apologize, time does not mean anything anymore. Um, we did a briefing for the executives at our utility on our plan. And we said, we, these are our objectives and these are our goals. We look forward to working with you, but if you don't work with us, this still stands, right? And the mayor delivered that, the city administrator was on the call and it was this like united front of, we're not backing down. And one of the things about being kind of a liberal bastion, which you are as well, is they know you won't. Like we might just be crazy enough to be the people that do it. And so there, there's fear, you know, from them of like, we have, we actually have to come sincerely to the table and discuss these issues. There's, there's weight in that. Okay, great. I had a question. Yeah. Okay. This is Louise. Hi, Louise. Shall I go ahead? I can read it if you like. So uh, Louise asked, okay. how did you come up with all of the creative ideas for surveying the community members? Can we see your list of those survey approaches and also see the surveys? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I'm happy to. I can follow up with Carl and share the, the surveys themselves, the actual questions. Um, and then the methodology for surveying really was the, I mean, the partners. Mm. Actually, Louise, can I, I'm going to ask you to clear. I'm gonna attempt this one and make sure this is really the heart of your question because I could see it going two different ways. We, when we launched, we launched A20 at a summit. So no, November 14th was the date that council um, passed the resolution. November 13th, we had a summit and we had um, hundreds of people. We actually had to turn people away because the space wasn't big enough. We didn't think we'd have this many people. And we, before we had the summit, we had a special partners only meeting and we invited a whole bunch of organizations and said, this is where we're going. Are you with us? And most, almost everyone signed up at that spot. And then we had regular check-ins with those partners. We also put all of our partners, the, the very first kind of after, after that kickoff, the very first meeting they had as a group was an equity training. We hired a private equity individual, um, a trainer to come in and everyone had to go through this baseline equity training. 
Oh. And I think that was critical because it normalized equity for people in a way that we talk about, but we didn't really, I think, all understand where we were coming from. Hmm. And then from there, it became clear. I think it, like a light switch for some, including myself, went off to say, right, if we're going to do engagement, we have to be thinking like this. Like, who are our underserved constituents and how are we going to reach them? And so that you know, was probably the best $3,000 we spent out of our budget in this process. Wow. wow, I'd love to know who who did that equity training for you. She's amazing, and I'm happy, I would be happy to give you her contact. She's also that would be good. And, um, okay, so that, but the, it was a creative process to come up with these ideas, because you said you, you know, you did something in a bar, you, you did like all these different diverse forms of, you know, getting input from the public going to Meals on Wheels, I mean, the backpack thing, you know, survey, all that. I mean, these are like all amazing ideas to really get to all different, for, you know, pe part, pe parts of the community, people in yeah. the We, okay, so um, more from a methodological standpoint, we also mapped out who the constituents were, right, that oh. we wanted to hit, and then would sort of identify, okay, parents are really, really hard to get, you know, like right. they care, but there's like no room in this universe. <laughs> so we went to our children's museum and we organized a 30 second activity for kids and we had a 30 second survey for, for caregivers. And uh, it was just like, let me get your input. And one of our staff was like, play with the slime and look, this is what the universe looks like. And we were over here just picking the I see. We did an ice cream party in a park. You know, like it was just this whole range of different kinds of activities, acknowledging um, that people are just going to have to come to us in different ways or we're going to have to go to them in different ways. So we, okay. we, did, uh, we did an actual kind of mapping. Good idea. Thank you. So the next question comes from uh, Doris. She asks, in terms of budget, what is the status of the budget process approvals and what type of pushback are you getting? Yeah, this is a good question. So we presented the plan formally to council at a work session and then they had it for formal consideration two weeks ago. And they, um, I don't know if you've seen this, there was some national press on this, they accepted it and thanked staff for it. And then they asked for two additional pieces of information. They asked for a formal prioritization framework and they asked for a funding plan. And then they also, um, in that same resolution, told us to start implementing it. So it's a, li it's a little confusing you know to understand like it's not adopted it's not formally adopted but we have permission to do it so what we've been working well what i've been working on i mostly um the hardest part of this entire process has been the staff like giving they have sprinted they are exhausted right like they and they want they want closure in this process just to know and i think i want that too like is it adopted or is it not and so i have sort of freed them to go do the work and i'm taking i'm taking everything that's left at this point like they need we need to have their minds in other places. So I spent the last two weeks working on that funding plan. And you know, this is where I'll get myself in trouble. I think it's a fool's errand. I don't know what funding is gonna look like in 2029. And I'm being asked to model what funding is gonna look like in that time frame. I don't know what funding is gonna look like in, in 2021 if we have a new president, right? Like all kinds of different revenue sources are gonna open up. But there that's where we are. So um, I drafted a funding plan. Um, I'm actually calling it an investment plan. I have a prioritization framework and we have a governance plan that gives them very clear direction on how we're gonna update the plan because it is meant to be living. And so what it would look like for feedback to get into that, that plan itself. The game plan, um, I will be on a call tomorrow for 90 minutes with the city administrator. We'll be mapping out our course of action. My instinct is um, we'll ask them to formally adopt it again on May 18th. And they will or they won't. And then in the budget, we have, um, we've asked for three new staff people. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens, of course, with COVID, but uh, the administrator has accepted that. So he will present his budget and his budget is the default budget, of course, unless there are edits and things made and three new staff people for our office are in that. That's where we stand. And I'm fundraising like a champion. So if you guys don't have any grants, let me know. The next question comes from Herb. How are you tackling eliminating fossil fuel powered heating and appliances in existing buildings, particularly given the way, sorry, particularly given the very large proportion of your emissions that come from buildings? Mm -hmm. A few different angles. 
Um, we are working with some of our businesses who have successfully electrified um, everything to understand what their pain points were, everything from pain points with the city itself, you know, in our permitting processes, so how we can get those out of the way, to pain points with the market. Um, and so that's helping us. We are working to organize a meeting of our energy efficiency installers. We've already had um, a set of meetings with our solar community, but we haven't really pulled together our energy efficiency community um, to get them involved and more deeply engaged in this work. They also were the market, right? Like that, if we take a step back on this question, because this is a complex question, our water heater blew in December, right? And we were on a natural gas heater. It took five, five people coming out before any of them gave us a quote for an electric heater. The rest were like, absolutely not. They didn't, they didn't feel comfortable with the technology. They didn't know an electrician that was on their staff that could help make the switch. That's unacceptable. Right, like there's no way we're doing mass electrification if that's the kind of hurdle everyone has to go through, right? So what we're focusing on is getting the marketplace ready, getting our like frontline staff trained on these technologies, working on incentives for them to be pushing the kinds of technologies we want first and not last. So that's one piece of the puzzle. We're also working with our utility. Um, we're in a community where there are no rebates for electrification, even if it's efficient, like far more efficient. So we're trying to push them to give new rebates and incentives. And then we're also looking at how we can possibly leverage the city dollars and or philanthropic dollars to do like a point of sale reductions in cost for electric appliances so they make them more alluring on the market. Those are just a few of the things. Um, the other thing we're talking about, we haven't figured out yet, is we have a solarized program. It's basically a solar bulk buy in the community. So um, it lowers the soft costs for the installers. They're able to the pass those costs on to individuals. We've been starting to brainstorm about tying in an energy efficiency audit as a requirement of that program so that the installers have to give you the whole package. You know, if you're gonna, if, if you're gonna spend $15,000 on solar, what if I can give you for $15,000 actually closer to net zero energy because we just did air sealing insulation and your solar, right? And so it, it's a better deal for you as an individual. The payback's better, et cetera. That's not electrification, but it is a really core part because when I lower your usage, suddenly electrification becomes more viable. Long-winded answer. You can clearly tell I'm working it out. How we're going to do that? I was struck by how you said that you went with the United Front to the utility and said, "If you're not going to work with us, we'll go it alone." Yeah. Tell yeah. me about the go it alone option and. What does that mean? Yep. That yep. So that? for us, um, we have a three-pronged approach to working with our utility. One is play nicely. Um, so we are working on a 24 megawatt install on a landfill in the city with our utility. The second approach is our franchise agreement. Right? We have a franchise agreement with our utility. Ours is from 1890 something. And it hasn't been legally challenged and we think it's probably challengeable. And so that's in our back pocket. Um, to throw at them and say, fine, if you don't want to play, we'll just open this franchise agreement and we'll ask for a new utility that shares our values and we'll go to bid. And then, of course, the last option is the nuclear option, and that is municipalization. Um, it is not something I talk lightly about. It is not also what I recommend as a course to start. And the reason I don't recommend that is it's not scalable. And part of our solutions are how do we use our high capacity city to create pathways that others can follow. And municipalization isn't an easy path. It's a very expensive path. It's a legal path. It's going to take a very, very, very long time. And we might be able to do it, but is our lower income neighbor going to be able to do it? Probably not. So it is on the table. Of course, we're thinking about it. Of course, we're legally looking at it, but it's not uh, the top strategy. So this next question comes from uh, Johanna. And she says that I understand that after your presentation to the city council of the plan, they did not approve the current draft of the A20 plan. What were the council's primary concerns or questions regarding the plan, and what are your next steps in moving forward? Let me take a laugh a little bit to think through. Uh, okay. Next steps are easier to answer. Next steps are, um, we're coming back to them with a funding plan, this investment plan. We're coming back, uh, they asked for these things, an investment plan and a prioritization framework. So those are fully drafted. We're just clearing them through kind of administrative processes. 
when those are done, they'll go to council and they'll have another opportunity to adopt the plan. So that is um, kind of the process going forward. Going back, the major objections. Let me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be dangerous and I'm gonna be really candid about what I think the major objections are. One is land use. Uh, we have a pretty divided community. I would say 49.5 to 50.5% about what our community should look like. And that is just a hot button issue. And it was insincere not to bring it into this process, but I think that's gonna be really, really tough um, for our electives to deal with. Cost, um, it's always an easy one to push back on. We also heard it wasn't aggressive enough, fast enough. That one angers me a lot um, when I hear that. Because what did you expect from an office that's had a budget for less than one year? I mean, there, there was no way that we were going to be able to have drastic reductions in two years from now, having not had a legacy of staff to build programs and initiatives. And so that one feels really disingenuous to me. And I think that there might be some more of that somewhere in play where the easiest thing to do is to pass a resolution. The second easiest thing, which is like moderately hard, is adopting this plan. The hardest thing is going to be implementing it. And I think people are starting to see that as they adopt the plan, they're going to be held accountable to implement it, implementing it. And then that, I think, I think some people are scared about the truth of what it's going to take to hit this goal that they've established. That is only my opinion, though. As a resident, by the way, I would like to say, just to clarify that. And the next question comes from uh, Michael Ahora. Are there any plans for sequestration in the process? Yep. So we only calculate, we do have urban forestry in there, and we only calculate the trees that the city plants and the sequestration potential for new trees. We don't look at historical sequestration potential because we're not actively cutting down any trees. Um, sometimes in projects, we've been asked to calculate the, the amount of carbon that's been sequestered in forests and things, and we certainly, or tree stock, and we certainly do that. Um, but we've mostly focused on go like if this is the baseline going forward what new kinds of trees should we be planting and what's the value of a tree so that it can be factored into the equation and then offsets um, offsets could come through sequestration i think it's very likely for us um, right now our community has sent a pretty clear signal that any offsets have to be additional if we go that route which i think everyone would agree with um, ideally, they want them to displace fossil fuels, though, and ideally, they want them in environmental justice communities and our frontline communities. So, in that case, it's not likely to be sequestration. It's likely to be more energy-based. But I could imagine a source of our offsets being kind of local bi bio sequestration or, um, you know, green infrastructure projects around the Great Lakes. But what, what's an energy-based offset? Um, investing in a large renewable energy installation in West Virginia that helps displace that fossil fuel um, based plant that's kind of hemorrhaging money anyway. And it gets that plant shut down and it gets renewables on the grid and those people put back to work in a uh, renewable. Okay, John, I think we've reached the last of the questions in the chat box, right? Correct. That's correct. Okay. All right, Missy, I think uh, it's it's a little over an hour. We didn't want to keep you too long because you have a lot of stuff on your plate, I can see. We really appreciate your taking your time to to um, to talk with us and to answer our questions and put yourself on the front line here. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I, uh, I think we want Herb, Herb's going to come on and, and make some closing remarks before we uh, end in the next couple minutes. So, Herb, can I turn it over to you? Sure. Uh, first, again, thanks, Missy. Uh, the uh, density of, of, of information and insight, it was remarkable. And we, we, I think I speak for everybody when we thank you for your work and your time with us tonight. And uh, we wish you good luck and uh, uh, very eager to see your financing plan there. <laughs> Um, I think many of you are, are familiar faces, but at least half the names and a few of the faces I'm looking at on the screen are not, and I'm delighted uh, that I don't recognize uh, many of, or at least not ever, all of the names and faces. So I just wanted to tell you for one minute a little bit about the climate mobilization, uh, the Montgomery chapter, a chapter. We're the group that actually got the county to pass the first emergency climate resolution in the country in December of 2017. And 
Um, we, um, our focus now, our strategic plan, if you want to call it that, for this calendar year and into next year is really very simple. And that's the focus on the plan, the plan, the plan, which Montgomery County is calling the CARP or the Climate and Resilience Plan, Climate Action and Resilience Plan. Uh, we have a slightly different term for it. We call it the ECARP, the Emergency Climate and Resilience Plan. We hope the county will start using that word emergency in front of it to signify its importance and its urgency. And so we invite you to work with us as we work with the county um, as partners and as critics, uh, depending upon uh, what's, what happens over the next uh, months uh, and into next year. We understand the county has selected a consultant. I see Stan on here. I guess you played a major role in that, but thank you for that. We are eager to see that process begin and uh, can't even imagine how it's gonna work at, at this time, but um, we're eager to support you in any way we can. Uh, we probably will try to do uh, similar kinds of presentations and discussions on a regular basis, whether that's every month or so, uh, on various aspects of the plan with uh, experts and speakers from inside and outside the county. Uh, so if you have any ideas, or if you feel you'd like to speak yourself, uh, please let us know. Uh, this is not uh, top down. Uh, we need all of your participation so that Montgomery County can ultimately have a, uh, a plan that's as compelling and as important at what, what Ann, as Ann Arbor has accomplished in these past few months or so. So with that, I'll turn it over back to Carl for uh, uh, closing out the session. Thank you, Herb. And let me just add that if by popular demand, we want to miss you to come back and talk to us again in three to four months and give us an update. We could always try to convince her to join us again. So, so thank you very much for, um, for attending. And we really are delighted that you're all here. And I hope you um, uh, work with us and uh, stay safe and healthy during these times. They're difficult, challenging times, but we want to keep uh, Keep addressing the climate emergency that we have as, as we deal with the pandemic at the same time. So thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. A special thanks to Missy. That was fantastic. And great, great job, Carl and Urban, everyone, climate mobilization. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you.